so here we have Lewis, patient of yours, who's looking to upgrade his anterior aesthetics. Uh, it looks like the patient had three veneers on number seven, eight, and nine <clears throat> done several years ago. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is the patient looking to do? So he has a crack on number seven veneer. He'd like to have that one redone. And I think he's concerned about the recession of the gums as well. So he just like to redo those three veneers in the front just to make them look more aesthetic, make them match a little bit better on the adjacent teeth. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, well, one of the things I always look at with aesthetic cases is trying to get a sense of the degree of complexity of the translucency of their teeth. This guy has a very translucent tooth appearance. So... The reason that's important at this stage of the process is it might be difficult to match three veneers to this here. Granted, he was happy with what he had, and we can definitely improve upon that. <clears throat> we always want to gauge the level of expectations of the patient. I often ask them on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being, I want my teeth to look perfect. Uh, where do they land? If they say 10, say, well, that might involve more cost and more time. Are you still okay with that? <clears throat> so managing patient expectations early in the process is important. But looking at teeth and saying, are these teeth easily matchable is an important part of the conversation. So you can see here that there's a lot of just translucent blue, black hue, uh, kind of a gray appearance, very polychromatic, very beautiful tooth, and one that a good lab technician with good photography can do. Um, it's a good question to ask early on, especially when you're trying to match a central incisor. And we're going to have a whole training module on that particular topic at some point, how to master the, um, the single central incisor uh, with ceramics or zirconia, whatever material you choose. Um, topic for another day. But another thing I want to comment on, <clears throat> doing good dental photography is <clears throat> extremely hard. Here you have some retractors which did a good job of pulling the cheeks back. But when we're planning an interior case, there's a couple data points that we want to be aware of. One of them is the cervical margin of the teeth, and then the mucogingival junction. So you can see our mucogingival junction up here, but then it disappears. And the reason we want to know that is we decided to plan this case in a way that um, we wanted to incorporate some level of periotherapy. We want to know where that level is. Um, can you bring me up to speed? I think you had said earlier that you referred this patient to the periodontist. What was the, um, the goal of that conversation? What transpired with that consult? So the reason we sent him to the periodontist is because one of his complaints was about the recession. So I sent him for a consult to the periodontist to see if some gingival grafting might be possible, if it's something he might be interested in doing just to upgrade the aesthetics. Because a concern he had that I explained to him in the beginning was that we could prepare the teeth down to the gum line again, but that the teeth may look long, and he didn't seem, like he seemed a little put off by the idea that his teeth might look long in the front. So that's why I sent to the periodontist. And the periodontist came back and they said that the gingival looked healthy and that there was no, I guess, medical need for the, uh, for the gingival grafting. Sure. Uh, they didn't. They didn't really seem to address the aesthetics of the veneer. Uh, yeah, that, that, that makes out from that. And that makes a lot of sense. Just looking at this this image alone, you know, a few questions we want to ask ourselves is, <clears throat> what is the patient's gingival biotype? Um, here, I would probably say it's moderate. I don't, I don't want to say thin. I, I'm concerned based on the recession that he has a thin biotype. <clears throat> But thin biotypes tend to be very scalloped. You know, he's somewhat scalloped in its gingival architecture. But he doesn't have recession anywhere else. You know, it's only the it's only the three teeth, which begs the question: Why does he have recession on the three teeth that he had restored? So again, these three teeth have veneers that were placed. Do you know how long ago they were replaced? Five years, ten years, twenty years? He's a young guy. It's, it's been a long time. I think he said around twenty years. Okay. So is it the end of the world that he has recession? No, but if you're going to redo them, you might want to ask the question, why does he have recession only on the teeth that were restored? So that you don't make that same, I don't want to say mistake, but don't recreate what nature obviously was having a hard time with. And we'll, 
we'll dive into that. And I think the, the answer is these veneers are not in the proper three-dimensional space. And how do we know that? But we'll come back to that. Um, if the patient doesn't want to do the gingival grafting based on the recession, that's okay, but the conversation needs to be had that we're going to be limited to some degree on how aesthetic these teeth are going to look. Now, if we, if we follow the line from the canines, this, the gingival zenus of the canines, and we come across like so, we're not off by much. You know, his natural tooth is actually uh, a little far superior compared to his canine. It's not that far here. You know, so if we restore these, are we going to have gingival symmetry across the midline? Probably not. This guy's going to be longer than that guy. With that said, is it relevant? You know, and that's something we need to have a conversation with the patient about their rest position. So if we go back to <clears throat> this position or this photo here, are we going to see that? Not really. You know, if we improve the aesthetics of these three teeth to match this guy, and there might be an argument that we can wear that one too, just to make it easier to match. Um, will the gingival asymmetry be noticeable? And the answer is probably not. Um, but an interesting observation here is just the, the roller coaster undulations of his occlusal plane and his gingival plane. You can see back here, there's kind of that step, and a lot of people have that. Um, the step comes up and then kind of dives down, and then back here, same thing. Not the end of the world, but it's something that we want to keep in mind because some patients don't like the aesthetics of uh, a posterior dummy smile. Again, this focus is right here, but it's an observation that this, uh, this occlusal plane down here is asymmetrical. It's more incisal or occlusal on the left side as it is on the right side with a normal smile. In addition, the distance between the incisal edge of number eight and his lower lip and the number nine and his lower lip are not symmetrical. So there's a cant here. And it's important to have patients understand that when we're trying to restore teeth in the confine or in the um, scaffolding or the framing of a cant, we're trying to create perfection in an imperfect situation. My guess is this guy doesn't care. He just wants you know, a 50% improvement of his current situation, uh, and he'd be happy, in which case, not that difficult to do. With that said, there's things like this when we're looking at the photos that are very, very important for us to consider when we're having the consultation with the patient. Do you have any questions on, on that aspect of it at, at this point? Uh, no, that makes sense. That's a good point about looking at the lower lip and the incisal edge position, though. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, photographs are everything. Uh, a clinician doing aesthetic dentistry without photographs of high caliber are driving blind. You know, they might get good uh, outcomes, but are they going to get good outcomes that don't have recession at 20 years? Uh, maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> so, another photo observation here is the recluded nature of his anterior teeth. You know, retroclined is another way to say this. Uh, if we were to put him in a category, would he be class one, two, or three? It's hard to say because he's not occluding. Um, you kind of have to surmise that he's somewhat class two because you can't have retroclination uh, of the upper anterior teeth unless the patient's somewhat either dentally or skeletally class two. Uh, but with the patient not occluding, it's hard to tell. So we're just going to assume he's dentally class two. He doesn't look skeletally class two, at least on this image alone. Uh, the reason this is important is because whatever material we put here, we want to ask the question, do we need to recontour the facial, the palatal, or the lingual, or both? And I think here the answer is both. And that recontouring can come in the form of ortho, it can come in the form of crowns, uh, enamelplasty. But I think what happened here, and let's take another look at this photo here. I think these are a little long. So I think the restorative dentist that placed these um, placed them in a, in a manner that they're long in a three-dimensional sense. And let's take a step back and just say, when we use the term long in aesthetic dentistry, we're often talking about the upper three to three or the upper interiors. Um, upper three to three is the ortho way of describing six through 11. When we have the conversation about this, we have to say, 
where do we want that incisal edge to be? And it's very common, especially when we're doing a single tooth or just a couple teeth, that the lab technician makes that decision. The doctor preps the teeth, sends the impressions in, and the lab technician has no nothing in three-dimensional space to make a decision on where to place this incisal edge. Uh, if you ever take a spear continuum, they have a curriculum called facially generated treatment planning, or FGTP. And it used to be spear, whoever's teaching it now, Kinzer or Deloitte or whoever is teaching that course at this point in time, would say the repose photo, the rest photo where the upper lip is resting gives you an indication of where this starting point should be. All treatment plans start with the incisal edge of 8 and 9 based upon the repose photo. We don't have that here, but I, I have a general sense of what's going on. I at least want to say this is longer than the canine tip. So if we draw a line between the tips of the canines, we come across as I keep going. Can you zoom out a little bit? I can't see sure. the canine in the picture. Is that a little better? I can see the lateral now, but still not the canine. A little more. Yeah, that's pretty good there. You can go back in a little bit. Okay. Perfect. All right. So if we draw a line from the tip of the canine <clears throat> over, see how much tooth is underneath that line? Uh -huh. So his natural tooth is actually a little shorter than this guy. The distal incisal edge here looks a little bit shorter than here. So I think this edge right here could be in the way, and it created nephrologic instability that presents itself in one of many different ways. When we have teeth that are in the way, upper maxillary teeth that are in the way, we can see one of many things. One of them is recession. We see that here, and it really makes sense. He only has recession on the three teeth that he had restored. Um, you can see cracked teeth or fractured teeth, fractured veneers. Uh, you can also see things like um, attrition, pathway wear, edge-to-edge -edge wear, crossover wear, and lastly, TMD or you know, occlusal instability manifesting itself as myofacial pain disorder because the muscles don't like where the mandible is. This is called an envelope of function problem. We'll, we'll take a look at it. <clears throat> Dr. Kinzer has a um, YouTube video, <clears throat> or Spear has a YouTube video with Greg Kinzer going over a case of this very similar nature, and we'll take a look at that momentarily. But the moral of the story is, is this tooth long? Well. Let's ask the question, if the incisal edge is in the right position, this tooth proportion looks good. The width to length ratio, I would say, is probably in the 75% range. This guy's are probably a little bit more, about 85%. The closer to 100% we get, the more square they are. The, this tooth here, its width to length ratio is probably 50%, uh, maybe 55%. Central incisors, you want at 75%, 70 to 80%, somewhere in there. Uh, so the tooth proportions look good, but where does the incisal edge live in three-dimensional space? I think it's too long, or it's too incisal. And if that happens, then the lower mandible has far farther to go to get edge to edge. And if the patient likes that position in three-dimensional space, then they're going to have problems. They're either going to chip and fracture things, or get recession, or all of the above. All right, so any questions there? You know, I think this is long. Just look at this tooth in relation to the other teeth. If you just look at it from that framing, it jumps right out. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Plus, we have the retrocline nature to it. So let's just say this tooth was the proper length, but we flared it. Would it be better? What does flaring do? It increases overjet. That might be what he needs. So we have overbite and we have overjet. Those two factors when we're designing the occlusion for an anterior aesthetic case is very important. In this case here, I think he lacks overjet. Maybe a little bit too much overbite. So let's take a look at the Kinzer. This is a, um, this is on YouTube. It's public, so I'm happy to share it here. Uh, I think they took some of their courses and made them public as teasers to go to the, you know, to go to Spear itself and watch all their courses. 
uh, you and I have spent some time on the spear.com website where there's a lot more information. But let's take a look here. This is a really good video to watch and I'll send it to you. He first goes over, now can you see the whole screen here? Uh, I cannot. It looks like I can only see like the right half of the screen. Alright. Can you see Yeah, I can see yeah, I can see it all now. Alright. Alright, so this is Greg Kinzer. He he is um, the protege for Frank Spear. He worked with Frank Spear for many years. He's a prosthodontist up in Washington. Very, very good dentist. He's seen him speak several times, and uh, he's very good. So he's going over anterior, the worn dentition. When we look at this patient, I'm not going to go back to that screen because I think it's going to kick us out, but um, our patient, Louie, had a lot of wear, evidence of wear on the anterior teeth, especially that which coincided with those veneers. Um, he goes over the different kinds of wear right here. All right, pathway wear, end-to-end -end wear, and crossover wear. These green lines are the vectors in which the wear occurs. Pathway wear, you tend to see patients who have very thin enamel in their front teeth, and it, you see that blue hue, and they tend to be kind of raggedy on the edge. That's a pathway wear patient. End-to-end -end patients, those are your... Um, John Coyce calls this the, these are rats, these are cows, because they tend to go side to side. And then crossover wear is when the tooth jumps over the other side, and then you end up getting wear on the inside. Those are patients you see loss of enamel on the lingles of lower interiors. We see it all the time. We just didn't know there was names to these particular patterns of wear. And some patients have more than one of these. So he goes over this in great detail, and I, I love this uh, particular slide right here. This green zone here is the patient's envelope of function, or envelope of motion. Uh -huh. Now, <clears throat> you can imagine here, because the patient has a very steep overbite, that their envelope of motion is a lot more restricted than somebody who has a more appropriate overbite and overjet, where they have a lot more freedom to move. A patient that has teeth oriented like this, have a lot less tooth issues. Patients who have these more restricted envelopes of function have more tooth issues, including posterior tooth issues. So we talk a lot about if we see fremitus on an anterior tooth, we often see cracked teeth in the posterior. It's a topic for another day, but what I'm trying to do here is bring your awareness to the signs and symptoms of front teeth that give us a greater picture of the patient's overall situation most importantly, when we're redesigning something on the anterior teeth, we need, we need to understand this so that we make good decisions on how to move forward. So when we do the guy's veneers, we need to ask the question, what is his ideal envelope of function, and how do we answer that? It's not an easy thing to answer. Uh, he did show this case here. The patient had broke their, um, their veneers. Not too dissimilar of a case. You know, they... I don't want to say these veneers look good, but the patient loved them. They just didn't like how they were breaking. Is the breaking of the materials a function of the material isn't strong enough, or is it a systemic problem? And I'll give you the answer to the test. Very seldomly, with the materials we have in dentistry today, is it the material? So if you watch a lot of Spear stuff, they talk about the continuum of strength of aesthetic materials. You have your empress or your felspathic porcelain. Uh, felspathic porcelain being the weakest, very aesthetic, but not very strong. Uh, then you have your empress, then you have Emax, then you have Laconia, of varying degrees. So that's just a basic continuum that we have. Those materials should all work well if the system is balanced and the patient's muscles are in a good spot. So it's easy to jump to the conclusion that the material is the problem. More often than not, it's not the material itself. So I'm not going to go too deep into this, but he does talk about the envelope of function, or what he calls the envelope of motion. I think there's one. Yeah, right here. Let's watch this together. 
So I think that she has a pathway and an edge-to-edge -edge wear problem. In fact, this is the upper initial cast that I asked the treating dentist to send me. Send me all of your old casts, right? impressions, whatever you have, just send them over. So what are we looking for? We're looking for pathway wear, palatal of uppers, facial of lowers, and then we have a flat edge. She's actually coming out and crossing the edge. This movement pattern is one of the most dangerous. You're going to want to be able to recognize this on your patients. So what has happened for her? They made the nears on the upper anterior teeth. They lengthened the upper anterior teeth. And now imagine if she continued to do the old movement pattern. Here she used to be able to get to the... You following him so far? Now, the difference with Louie might be that the material didn't fracture, although it did a little bit on number seven. The stress created from the fact that his muscles want to be in a position with that lower incisor, incisal edge is where the material of the veneer is, put stress on the teeth, created a torquing force, and caused recession. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's what, when I said the veneers are too long, I'm not saying aesthetically with the length ratio. I'm saying in three-dimensional space, they're too incisal. There's too much overbite. Or Yeah, so aesthetically they're not too long, but for example, of a function, they're too long. They're too long, yeah. yeah let's see if there's anything else. The edge edge position, and now there's a piece of ceramic in the way. And instead of changing the way her mandible moves, she's just continually doing it, and what's the risk? She broke the ceramic. All right. So these are really, they don't just chip restorations. They'll snap edges off. All right. So that's that. <clears throat> Any questions about the spear stuff? You go to spear education. There's a lot of, well, you, ha you have access to spear.com where all the content is, but there's free content on YouTube for the general public. No, yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right, let's switch back over to this guy. And one thing I forgot to mention you in the beginning, one of his complaints. So when he had those veneers done, he had a diastema. So he had the veneers done to close the diastema to eight and nine. Yep. So now that he wants the, the veneers redone, he actually wants the diastema back. Okay. Yeah, that's easy enough to do. Um, we had talked about doing some prototyping ahead of time. Uh, you sent the case he to Glide He was going to send me some pictures, too, of how he used to look. Yep. He never actually did. I was going to, with the temporaries, I was going to adjust them and, you know, have them look in the mirror until we get right where we want to be. But. Right. Yeah, we can use the temporaries as prototype to get him to confirm it and have him wear it for a couple weeks. Uh, it would mm -hmm. definitely be helpful. Um, so I guess the question here is, number one, where do we want the incisal edges to start? If we think he's a little long, I don't, I, I can't say whether he's long or if he's too retruded. How are we going to flare these teeth? If, if inadequate overjet is the problem, and I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's probably the problem, and we can work that out with the temporaries. What... What are our options here? There's, there's two major solution strategies that we could use here. For fixing the overjet? Yeah. Or overbite? Both. So one would be ortho Invisalign yep. to try and release the, um, the entrapment that way. Yeah. So moving the lower end to your teeth downward. The other way would be you could procline the upper anteriors? Yep. So a proclination of upper anteriors to make them more um, in line with what nature had intended. Just the fact that they're retruded tells us quite a bit. Um, could we intrude the lowers? Well, they, we already see they're already intruded enough. You could level this lower curve of speed to improve things. You know, an orthodontist could actually open up his bite to increase the overbite 
and improve the overjet simply by leveling the lower curve of the speed. Um, yeah, so that, that, that definitely is an option. But as far as reducing the lower teeth or intruding them alone, you, you really have to level the whole curve of speed. Um, because of the fact that it has kind of this roller coaster appearance. But yes, intruding is one. Intruding the lowers is one. Flaring of the uppers is two. We're obviously concerned about flaring these because of the periodontal compromise that already exists. Um, another option is to enamel plasty the lowers. He's already worn through a lot of them. So you could flatten this to some degree. Yeah, you really have, if you watch the Kinzer video, you'll get a pretty good sense of how tricky that can be where you maintain the centric stops without changing the canine guidance and the protrusive um, contacts. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not tricky. It, it is tricky. The option that we're probably going to do is just use restorative means to increase his overjet. So patient comes in wanting new veneers. If we use veneers, we're probably not going to change the lingual surfaces of the teeth. So we're not going to necessarily change the overjet. So we almost have to do crowns here. You know, I'd, I'd like to look at some models to get a better sense of, of that. Uh, you and I will be doing the case together, so we can, you know, probably what we'll do is actually use some composite. If the patient's up for it, let us use some composite to make these teeth look really good. We'll decrease the overjet through enamelplasty and reduction of the veneers. Have him go into rest, make sure the incisal edges are in a good spot. Once we're happy with the in-mouth mock-up, then we take an impression of that, and that's what the lab uses to copy, then we prep the teeth. So we can, we can do this, because it's three teeth, we can do this on the fly as long as we have, you know, snap stone, something to pour up the models. You know, we're going to want to create some reduction guides using Siltec cutting matrices. And I'll bring all of that stuff up with me when we do this. Um, but I did want to, you and I were talking a little bit earlier about how much wear he has on the lower interiors. Let's just take a look at that. And this is maybe putting this part of the process a little early. We can see how much wear he has. So he has edge-to-edge -edge wear. We, we can see it because we can see the dentin right here. We see a wear facet right here based upon that shiny surface. I can see one right here, which in another video, you're actually going to see this to a great extent, which makes sense why he broke that. Um, maybe some crossover wear right here. You can see how the lingual aspect of a lower incisor has some chipping. That typically only happens when the mandible kind of falls on the other side of the, um, the upper teeth. But let's take a look at... I mean, look at that wear facet. Now, if that doesn't screen the problem, then we're not looking. So we see this, this tooth that suffered some rather catastrophic biomechanical failure, and we have the answer to why right here. But without these photographs, this is easy to miss. We come through, we just redo the veneers, the patient comes back three weeks later and they broke it. And you say, well, the lab screwed up. So then you do another set. The lab screwed up. So then you change it to another lab. That lab uses a stronger material. And all of a sudden, they start to have increased recession right here. At no point did we change the fact that nature is telling us what's going on. <clears throat> this lower tooth wants to be more free. The lingual surface of this veneer is in the way. It's either too long or too retroclined. And it, it's inhibiting that envelopal function. So there's a lot of clues that we have here. We can see some craze lines in the teeth. His mandible has been stressed in its current position. So we have to account for that. All right, what do you think? Not a lot of information, but you know, mm -hmm. that's super helpful. Take a look at these photos. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that, that lower canine does scream. <laughs> yeah. Does definitely scream at you. You know, now that you saw a case like this, you're going to start to see more and more of this in the majority of your patients. You know, in dental school, we're taught, we're, we're taught to fix decay and single tooth problems. We're not taught to, to see these things from a high level. That's where Spear, Kois, Kanky, Dawson all come in. They teach us to look at things at a higher level. Um, I have definitely noticed this with my periodic exam since I've been diving into Dawson, as you know. Yep. I, I definitely look at wear a lot different now. So. Yeah. Helps me help explain it to patients too. That it's you know it's not normal <laughs> to have all that. 
severe wear. Right. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it up here. You know, what's interesting is his incisal edge lands on his wet dry line. So the position, at least from a buccal lingual perspective of this, is actually in the right spot. So we're, we're probably just going to take it and put it like right there. That incisal edge right there. A little more facial, a little less over jet, a little, uh, sorry, a little less over bite, a little more over jet. And then we'll recontour the lingual surfaces based upon what we see when we uh, have the patient in the chair. So it might be a little bit beyond the scope. So for a case like this, you're thinking crowds over veneers. How are we going to recontour the teeth with the crowns in order to prevent the same like ceramic interference with the envelope of function. Yeah, by by increasing the um, increasing the overjet, so the lingual surface of this tooth will be modified through the use of the crown. Mm -hmm. Now, there are times when a tooth is so retroclined that we can't prepare the tooth for a crown to be aesthetically and functionally in the right spot. Uh, we'll go over that in detail. We might have to do some ortho just to properly position this tooth. Um, this is where, you know, a set amount of models that give us some sort of insight of where the patient might be able to go becomes very helpful. But I'm very confident so we can do this. When I get those models back from the lab, want me just to mount them like in MIP and go from there? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's all kinds of things we could do with the models. Maybe we'll do that when I go up. But I think the, uh -huh. the observation here that the use of crowns will give us more control over freeing up his mandibles so that he doesn't have a biomechanical replication of the problem, so to me, that's the lesson here. Veneers are great when the system is But we're not doing anything with the lingual if we do veneer. Correct. In a patient that has perfectly well-positioned teeth and has a harmonious nephrologic system, Veneers are great, but that's not the case here, evidenced by all the signs and symptoms that we just looked at. All right, what do you think? Lots to unpack there. That was super, super helpful, Nick. I appreciate it. Sure. So we're definitely going to be a lot, we're going to have to communicate really closely with the lab, too, in terms of how they shape the linguals. Yeah. With the crowns and everything like that. Just, I think learning how to write up the lab slip so that we can get them to do what we want would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to. Um, or is the prep going to kind of lead them? We can skip the lab with this. I don't want to say the lab doesn't play a good role here. But what I would say we do is we do the lab work in the patient's mouth with his articulator, his natural articulator. But the lab just not. Glidewell especially, they're not going to be able to create teeth with this high level of consideration. Um, what I say we do, if they've already produced bio temps or wax ups for you, that's fine. Um, we may still use them. But I think what we're going to do is we're going to use composite in the patient's mouth and occlusal equilibrate the lingual surface. I say occlusal equilibrate. Uh, increase the overjet until we're happy, and we'll do that together. Uh, and then we'll take an impression of the upper arch with that modified facial surface with composite and the reduced lingual surface. That's our new starting point. That's what that's where we want the veneers to be made in, in three-dimensional space. And we'll send it to a lab. We'll send it to Arrowhead <clears throat> or any lab that's capable of taking that information and, and duplicating at 100% so that the veneers you get are exactly the same as what we've modified in the patient's mouth. So a wax up in the beginning isn't always the, it's not always the final endpoint. We use wax ups for diagnosis, we use wax ups for temporaries, we use wax ups for uh, communication with the patients, you know, there's all kinds of different reasons to do it. I think what you did here is good is you started the process of using a wax up in the process of a very, uh, I don't want to say complicated, but very tricky anterior case to do well. And 
we may not use that information in the way that maybe you had planned, but that's okay. We're, we're going to do it in the patient's mouth. He's going to improve the aesthetics. You and I are going to improve the overjet and overbite. And then we take a snapshot of that through an impression, and then you prep the teeth from there, the crowns. Perfect. Cool. Make sense? Yeah, it does. Cool. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. I'll send you this video shortly.